live from the rooftop of the Herman London Real Estate Group in beautiful downtown Maplewood. It's the St. Louis Realtor Podcast with your host, Adam Cruz. Welcome, welcome everybody to the St. Louis Realtor Podcast live from the rooftop of the Herman London Real Estate Group. I'm your host, Adam Cruz, here with my co-host, Shannon St. Pierre. Hello. Realtor extraordinaire. And we have a packed house today because our guest is really popular and what we're going to be talking about is super interesting and so i'm going to introduce our other i guess attendees or what what would you like to call yourselves so we have three of our other agents in the room lauren burns hello natasha Hawatme simon how's it going and we've got matt simon here hello and our very special guest today is maureen mcmillan hi everybody hello and she's a historic preservation consultant She has her own company, and I'm going to read your bio real quick. Maureen works as a private consultant assisting clients seeking federal and or state of Missouri historic tax credits for their residential and commercial rehabilitation projects. From the initial site visit to determine the viability of their project, through project final application, she educates clients on the requirements of the programs and handles all of the necessary paperwork related to the tax credit applications. And I want to give a disclaimer to anyone listening. A lot of the things that we say today are how it is today, right? And so like Maureen was telling me earlier, things are always changing. And so I don't want you to listen to something that we say today and assume that it's still the case. We encourage you to call Maureen if you have a project going on and get like the updated information, basically. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, do you mind starting for all of us and our listeners just kind of giving an overview of what is a preservation consultant? What is a tax credit? Can you kind of... Sure. So uh, back in the 1970s, the federal government created a federal historic tax credit program. Uh, It was used for income producing properties. It was only for federal, for your federal tax credits. But a lot of states began looking at that as a model for economic development. And so in 1997, the state of Missouri passed legislation to create a state historic preservation tax credit. Um, Went into effect in January of 1998. um, And it it is designed to be an economic development tool. Um, So the historic tax credit is, again, it's an incentive to invest money um, in real estate development. It returns a tax credit to the developer to offset the cost of doing a historically appropriate rehabilitation. So since it is a historic preservation tax credit, there are guidelines that we have to follow. Um, You can't just go in and kind of do whatever you want. You can't gut the building and do the big open floor plan um, if you still have an intact historic floor plan. There are going to be certain spaces where changes are limited or prohibited, certain spaces where you have more leeway, um, and we'll kind of get into that discussion, that, that kind of specific information a little later, but... The return on your investment is that you get a tax credit in the amount of 25 cents for every dollar that you invest that is a qualified rehabilitation expenditure. So economic development and and historic preservation development kind of has its own lingo, um, as with most industries. So a QRE, or a qualified rehabilitation expenditure, is an expense that is incurred in the rehabilitation of a building that is part of the building itself, and that is permanent to the building. That's kind of the shorthand rule of thumb. You may have project expenses that are not considered qualified rehabilitation expenditures because they are outside the footprint of the building. They are something, a portable item that you could pick up and take with you like an appliance. Um, But the rule of thumb is you have to, you get 25 cents on the dollar for those QREs. Now a tax credit is not a check. What the state is going to give you is a form letter that says you have tax credits in the amount of whatever. Um, and you can use that tax credit to offset your state historic 
uh, or your state income tax liability. Now, the state, the nice thing about the state of Missouri program is that you can either apply that tax credit to your current year's income taxes, the year that you're filing. You can carry it back three years and claim a refund from the state of Missouri on previously paid income taxes. If you want to continue to apply it against your income tax directly, you can do that for a period of 10 years. Or alternatively, and this is what a lot of people do, they sell them to a third party. There are always people with you know high value folks who are looking to take a little bit off the top of their, their tax burden. So they will pay you 90, maybe 93 cents on the dollar if you're lucky. You get cash in hand and they get a little bit of a discount on their income tax. So there are a, a, a number of ways you can use that tax credit, the state tax credit. Um, so that's what it is. The state is not going to send you a check. They're going to send you a form letter that you can use in a number of ways to offset state income taxes. The federal credit, on the other hand, can only be used to offset federal income taxes for a period of 20 years, you cannot, at least at this time, you cannot transfer them to a third party, so they are not sellable. Um, but again, they do give you 20 years to apply them against your federal income taxes. So that's what a tax credit is. Um, so in our case, these are, this, you know, these are historic preservation tax credits. They are tied specifically to this program. Um, you get them... After you have completed your project, you submit your final application, you submit all of the expense documentation that they request from you, and then after um, you have to pay a nominal fee to the state of Missouri, at which time they will release to you your tax credit voucher. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Okay, so it's nice. basically the state or the, the federal government saying, we want you to invest in this neighborhood, but we want you to kind of keep it looking the same. But it, so they're not available in every neighborhood. They are not. You have to be either individual. Your building has to either be individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which usually applies to kind of the big, significant landmark buildings, um, or your building has to be considered a contributing resource to a registered historic district. Now, in St. Louis, we have, a, we have a number of historic districts. Some of them have been nominated to the National Register of Historic Places. Some of them were created by local ordinance, which means they are certified local historic districts, which means that they meet the criteria to be on the National Register. They are recognized as, as potentially being eligible to be on the National Register, but they have not gone through that formal nomination process. Instead, they are created by the Board of Aldermen by local ordinance. But you, your building has to be in a historic district or it has to be individually listed on the National Register. So you're looking if you're, you know, you, we have a lot of neighborhoods in the city that are historic districts, but not everything in the city has been registered. So are there any areas in the county? Or is there this, are. Okay. Um, there are historic districts in the, in the city. There are historic districts in the county. There are historic districts in a lot of small towns across the state of Missouri. A lot of small towns have their historic downtowns, their historic main streets, and they too are eligible for historic tax okay. credits. I mean, it sounds like a huge benefit to people. Obviously, they're getting kind of a 25% discount in a lot of ways on what they're doing. Is Are people not doing them sometimes because of things other than the red tape or because they, they want to change the look of the building? Those are the two biggest reasons. Some people don't want to be bothered with the process. Um, they just, you know, they don't find it. They find it either inconvenient. They just don't want to, they don't want to, they just don't want to be bothered. Um Sometimes people choose not to do it because what they what their vision is for that building and the way they want to design that space is incompatible with the standards that oh, that we uh, that are that are governed that govern this program. So we are governed by the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, and there's a set of guidelines that go with that that kind of tell us in general terms the do's and the don'ts. And so those guidelines, those standards are going to be concerned primarily with what they consider to be 
the public spaces or the private uh, the the or the um the public spaces or the primary spaces of a building so when you're looking at a building the front wall is always going to be the most public space of that building the further you go to the back the less primary that space is the more room you have to make some changes when you get inside the building it is generally considered that the primary spaces the public spaces are your entry hall your foyer whatever your stair hall whatever that circulation space is and then your two front rooms um, on the assumption that historically you had maybe a, par a formal parlor and a secondary parlor and that's where your company would have come and so they're always looking at where would your public have come and and the way they, they the way that gets applied to houses is kind of based on when the federal credit was initially created it was designed for commercial buildings so where would your customers have come where would your public have come so when you adapt that to houses you think about where would your guests have come where would your company have come so there are certain spaces and if you're looking at a two-family flat or a multiple family building that may apply to every unit in the building or at least the first several floors um, so that two-room rule and the and the hallway is more or less going to apply um, in in each of those units within multiple family buildings. Okay, and so for clarification purposes on the tax credits, the federal tax credits can only be used for income producing properties. Yes, and you have to hold the property for five years. Okay, so, so you can't rehab it and then and resell sell it. it. No, you have to hold or on live for a it. minimum of five years. What? You it also can, can't rehab it and live in it unless you're living in one of the units? Yes. So you right. can live in it as long as it's still income producing, as in like a multifamily. You live in one unit, the other and unit is And you rent the other unit or units out. in the building. However, that's not the case with the state tax credits, correct? Absolutely. No, it is. Absolutely. The state tax credit can be used for strictly for owner-occupied properties. So let's say you want to rehab your own home. Okay. You can use the state historic tax credit program exclusively for that. If you are doing a, a an income producing property, you can use the state historic tax credit in tandem with the federal historic tax credit, in which case you would get 25% back from the state and an additional 20% in tax credits from the, from the federal. Um, you can also use that state tax credit for properties that you want to flip. Um, lots of investors use this pro this program. They will um, they they develop properties. They sell them on to people who will then end up being owner occupants. So you can use the the state program has a lot of flexibility both in how you use the final credit that you get and also how you use the building itself. Is there a simple website that I can go to to find out what areas in the county or the city are? in his, these historical districts? You can do um, a Google search for Missouri National Register. If you just plug in Missouri National Register, you can it'll pull up a page and it'll be, list them by county. Okay. So you can do a search by county and that will give you the National Register historic districts. Um, you can also... Uh, if you're on that same page, um, it, you, there, if you use the little search bar up in the top and you say certified local districts, that same historic preservation website will take you to the St. Louis and the Kansas City certified local districts. St. Louis and Kansas City are the only places that have certified local districts. So, um, so if you're on that, um, that, that web page for the Missouri National Register districts, you can also kind of leapfrog over and find the certified local districts in the city of St. Louis. Before everyone dives into their more specific questions, do you mind giving your contact information? Sure. Um, so if you want to reach me by phone, my cell number is 314-402-9445. My email has a lot of M's in it. Um, M.T. McMillan, and McMillan is spelled M-C-M-I-L-L-A-N at A-T-T dot net. 
I have a question about, I guess, the application process specifically and um, if, I guess, it's competitive or not. Like, what kind of steps do you have to take once you've identified a building? With the assumption that there's a limit on the tax credits, I guess? Yes, and if there's certain financial thresholds you have to meet. There are. So for any project, um, for the state of Missouri, the other criteria that you have to meet for eligibility once you've established that it's in a historic district, it's a contributing building. And when I say it's a contributing resource, I mean that it is a building that was built during the period of significance for that district, which means that most, most neighborhoods had a period during which most of the construction happened. And that was when the biggest period of development for that neighborhood. When they say they establish a period of significance for a district, that's what they're talking about. And they're looking for buildings. When they survey the district to create that district, they... um, they identify those buildings that were built during that period of significance. Those are the contributing buildings. You may have a building that was built in a historic district, but it was built in the late 1970s, and the period of significance ended in 1945. That building will be, probably be listed as a non-contributing resource because it is a essentially a new building in a historic district. So... You do have to be sure that you are a contributing resource within a historic district. For the state program, you have to spend 50% of what you paid for the building on your qualified rehabilitation expenses. For the federal program, it's a different threshold, and it's actually a somewhat higher threshold, and it's a little more complicated formula. So for the federal program... They are looking to strip out the value of just the building. So they take what you paid for the building, you subtract out any depreciation if you have it. You may have owned the building 20 years, in which case you would have potentially have depreciation. You would add back in any appreciation, again, if you have it, and you strip out the value of all of the land associated with the parcel. Not just the backyard, but also you strip out the value of the land that the building is sitting on. That takes you down to the value of just the building itself. And then you have to spend 100% of that number. So that can be a little tricky to figure out. And really, that only you only have to really start slicing and dicing to get to that number if, for example, you paid a lot for the building and your rehabilitation expenses may not quite be more than what you paid for the building that's when people start having to really figure out how to how to um how to get to that adjusted basis so many details i can see why people call you it it's it it is not it is not for the faint of heart you'd hate to do a a project thinking you're going to get all these tax credits because you're kind of spending extra money in some ways to do it yes you are to this guidelines and then find out you're not actually going to get the money right and um and and if you're new at this, the rules, not only the rules about the numbers and, you know, getting the paperwork filled out right, but the under, more importantly, the understanding of what changes you're allowed to make to the building and how you make them is where it's really easy to get in trouble and do something wrong and find that you have gotten, you are denied on the back end. So those are the things, those are the places where, you know, hiring a consultant makes a lot of sense. So do you, uh, is it possible to go through this process or start this process like mid rehab? No, for the state of Missouri, the only expenses that are considered to be eligible are those that are incurred after your application has been received by the Department of Economic Development. It does not mean that you have to have preliminary approval, although there are some changes to the rules that are coming that are going to affect when your costs begin to count. Historically, though, the state says once your application, your preliminary application, is received by the Department of Economic Development, that is when your expenses begin to count. Um, but again, there are some changes that are coming. Those are still kind of in the works. Um, so we're not exactly sure how that's all going to shake out yet. And so I'm a little hesitant to 
go too much into detail about what those changes are because, again, we don't know exactly where they're going to land. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the application timeline and how long it takes to, you know, start to finish to get these tax credits? Or even to be approved, like you said. Right. So um, the application process is broken up mainly into two parts. You have to submit a preliminary application. And as part of that preliminary application, there is, an, there is a preliminary application form. There are backup documents that they are going to require as part of the application. They want a copy of your settlement statement so they know how much you paid for the building. Again, because they need to know that you're going to hit that 50%. They're going to want a copy of your recorded general warranty deed or special warranty deed, if that's what you happen to have. Um, to show that you, in fact, are the owner of the building. They're going to want things like um, before photos, showing the condition of the building as it is right now. They're going to want um, a set of floor plans showing the existing condition of the building, what we typically refer to as as as-builts, although if your building has been changed over time, obviously the as-built, is not really as it was built, but as it sits right at this moment. Um, And then you submit a set of proposed floor plans showing what you want to do to the building, what changes you want to make to the floor plan. Um, Additionally, if you are a company that is applying, they're going to want a, a number of company documents, your operating agreement. If your company has two or more members, you have to enroll in the E-Verify program with the Department of uh, Homeland Security. Um, So there are going to be company-related documents that you have to provide as well. Um, So there is is a substantial, and you also, the other thing you have to include are copies of the historic district survey map showing that your building is in fact a contributing resource to that district. So there's a fairly hefty packet of stuff that has to go in. Depending on how many of those pieces you have and how long it's going to take you to get them together. So typically the consultant will come in and take the photos for you. Um, That's usually part of a consultant's job, taking the photos, walking through and making sure you understand before you develop your proposed plan what changes you're allowed to make, where you can make them. Um, You don't have to have full-blown architectural drawings. I have a number of clients who will do their own. As long as you can, within reason, lay out the the floor plan of the building, show the location of windows and door openings and things like that, where the stairs are, um, you can do them by hand. Um, Assuming, of course, that the city isn't requiring you to provide full-blown architectural drawings. But you do need that as-built set and you need the proposed plans. Um, And so... Pulling everything together that's necessary for the application, it's going to depend a little bit on how quickly you can pull all of those things together. Um, A big part of the preliminary application is going to be a description of all of the work that you're proposing to do to the building and what the condition of the existing features are. So to do that, a lot of consultants are going to be asking you questions about You know, okay, what are you doing to the roof? What are you doing to the masonry? What are you doing to the floors? Where are you making changes to the walls? So there's going to be a lot of back and forth, making sure the uh, consultant understands what it is you're doing to all of those things because that's going to be a big chunk of the application is making sure that the reviewer at the state understands what you're proposing to do to the building to ensure that it's going to live within those guidelines. So assuming you have all the preliminary legwork done and you go f- forward with the application, I mean, typically, are we talking weeks, months, years? Well, <laughs> for the approval of that for, initial. For the preliminary approval, <coughs> pardon me. Wait, are you asking that, Matt, with the assumption that you need to, I guess you have to wait to hear back from them before you start on the project? Um, I'm just asking what uh, you know the average client can expect on a time frame process from start to finish, how long this typically takes. Right, because everyone's always worried about sitting on the investment. They want to get work started right away usually, right? Absolutely. So that's a big concern. That's a big concern. And um, so, again, you're allowed to begin work once your application is submitted. 
Typically, when I mail an application into DED, they receive it in two business days. They stamp it that they have logged it in, or they've stamped it that they received it, and that stamp date is the login date. So you are when technically... When you can be, incur expenses. That is when you're typically allowed to incur expenses. However... Um, and this is a big however. Right now, the State Historic Preservation Office, which reviews the scope of the work, um, that's their role in this, in this program. They are currently running, they have been running about a year behind on their reviews. They had been grossly understaffed. Um, they have hired up a few new people, so they're trying really hard to plow through that backlog. Um, in normal times, the review period would be 30 working days, which would be about a month and a half. So, again, we're pretty far off that right now. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. We are pretty far off so that right now. So when you say a year, that, I mean, that's pretty far off. So you don't even get your voucher for... And then once... Well, so assuming that you get your preliminary review, in a, and I have projects, to be quite honest, I have projects that have been finished and sold. And we don't have preliminary review. Okay, because that was going to be my next question. So you can still sell it, and then they can and then still you review just, it, and they still and get your voucher. And hopefully you lived within the guidelines, and you didn't do anything that they have any major concerns about. Um, but then, once your project is finished, there is a second application phase. You have to submit a final application. Um, and the biggest part of that final application is going to a CPA who understands the tax credit program. Not every CPA does. You want to find a CPA who knows the tax credit program, who's going to take all of your proofs of payment, all of your invoices, your material receipts, all of that stuff. They're going to put it into a spreadsheet the way the state of Missouri wants to see it. They're going to organize all of your backup documentation in the right format, and that is called either a cost compilation, which is one level of review for projects that are under $250,000 in construction costs. If your construction costs are $250,000 or higher, you have to have what's called a 100% cost certification, which is a somewhat higher level of review of those expenses. So that is the biggest piece of the final application process. Once your CPA, once we finally get the preliminary approval in our hand and we have that expense certification from the CPA, we submit the final uh, final application document along with after photos so that they can see that what you did lives within the guidelines. You did what you said you were going to do in the application. Um, so there will be final photos keyed into a floor plan so that the reviewer at SHPO can look at those photos, look at that floor plan, make sure that it it, it is done properly. Um, and once they've signed off on it, then it gets in line over at DED. And DED will just go back through that expense certification to make sure that there aren't any ineligible expenses that somehow got through and the CPA didn't catch them. And, you know, or they, they look for little things. Um, so, it can be a process to get your final, to actually get that voucher in your hand. Because not only do you have to get through the preliminary review, but then once you have that, then you have to go through that second step of the application process. So right now, it is definitely a challenge. Um, we're hoping that with the addition of staff at both SHPO and DED, they will get caught up again and be more... Um, operate more on their traditional timelines, which again, were 30 working days for SHPO to review your preliminary application. And back in, back in the good old days, um, DED would, once they got the uh, final application, assuming that the preliminary review was in place and the SHPO did their final review again within 30 working days, DED could was routinely turning around those tax credit vouchers within a couple of months. So once we get back to normal timelines, you're looking at maybe a couple of months waiting for your preliminary review on the front end, and then probably, um, you know, three to four months on the back end, again, once we're able to get back to those normal timelines. 
So we're looking at about six to 18 months, generally speaking, depending on the scale of the project and right. all the documentation right. needed to be reviewed. And, and rules are going to be different for really large projects. Projects that have a, like a million plus in um, QREs are treated differently. Um, those that are receiving $275,000 or more in tax credits, um, there is a cap per year on those projects. So if you have one of those large projects, you could submit your application and they may say the cap for this particular fiscal year has been exhausted which means that then your project would get in line in the next fiscal year to receive credits in that fiscal year. Hopefully, I've never seen anybody not get their get approved for their tax credits in the following fiscal year if they if they if they missed the cap on the when they first uh, applied. I've never seen anybody not be put in line right you know for the second for the next fiscal year. Um, I've never seen anybody pushed out beyond that. But there is a cap on the large projects. There is no cap. There is no fiscal. There is no budget cap on small projects. So when you hear about Historic tax credits having, there's a cap, and it's so many millions of dollars a year. That only applies to the large projects. People can do small projects all day long, and there is no cap. So there's no point at which they're going to say, we've used up all of our money for this year, and you're out of luck. But a project is based on an address. You couldn't have multiple projects at the same property. So if you have... um, I have a couple of projects um, where we have more several buildings on a parcel. Sometimes in old neighborhoods, you had a, a, a house on the street and you had an alley house in the back. Um, for the state purposes, we have treated that as, because it is really kind of one large rehabilitation project, the state will treat that as one application. For the federal, though, if you're doing that as rental property, those will be separate federal applications because they are physically separate buildings. Um, But you can do, now if you have, um, let's say you buy five buildings on a block and and you're essentially going to rehab them all at one time, they are still, for the state's purposes, separate applications because each address there is its own application. So... uh to go back a little bit, you mentioned the QRE budget, and I was just kind of wondering, you, you know, it, it had to be a fixed and permanent part of the structure, correct? So, right. uh, like plumbing, electric, is that all eligible? Absolutely. Roof, facade, we talked about facade, that's eligible. Flooring? Yes. Okay, uh, what about interior painting? All of those things, again, if it becomes a permanent part of the building. So the things that are typically excluded, and this isn't an exhaustive list, so don't come back to me later and say, but you said. So, But the typical things that are excluded are things like appliances, window treatments, mirrors, those kinds of furniture items. Like you may, um, you may get like a large... Um, armoire and you can even fix it to the wall but that's still considered personal property um shelving is can is an ineligible expense so if you put whether you put wire shelving in your closets or wood shelving in your closets shelving as an entire category is excluded they're also going to exclude a uh, carpet counts if it's tacked down if it's a rug no Um, they're also going to be looking to exclude work done outside the footprint of the building. So let's say you have a building where you have to do a new water line, a new sewer, you have to bring new electric into the building. The rule there is on the electrical, for example, once it touches the building, it becomes eligible. So your panel, your wiring, your light fixtures, all of that stuff, once it's in the building, it's eligible. Water and sewer lines, this is governed by an IRS rule. From everything within the building, so every all your water lines and sewer lines that run inside the basement, going out uh, four and a half feet are considered eligible. 
from that four and a half foot mark out to the connection in the street is considered site work and therefore not considered to be eligible as a rehabilitation expense. So that's an IRS distinction. So you want to make sure that your plumber can reasonably give you a number and say this portion is from the from the building out to the street, that part is ineligible, this portion is within the footprint, within that four and a half feet and in the building, and therefore that part is, is eligible. And generally, DED is just looking for you to give them a number. What about rooftops? Do, would those count? We're doing a rooftop. Would that count as part of the building? When you say redo, like a rooftop deck? Sure. If it's new construction, anything that's new construction is considered ineligible. Now, if you have a, if you have a porch, um, that is eligible. If you're putting on a new deck or a rooftop deck, no. They'll allow you to put it on generally, but they won't allow you to claim the expense. If you're doing a new addition to a building, let's say you've got a relatively small building and you want to build out, and you, um, so you, you know, frame it out, you put your hardy board all the way around, that new addition is considered ineligible because it is not part of the historic structure. So when you're talking about QREs, you're talking about materials, not materials and labor fees and labor. Yes. So it, for all those little um, do-it-yourself or rehabbers, um, are, can you do some of the work yourself? And yes. how do you? But it, if can you, you only claim materials and not labor, right? If you are doing your own project, you cannot pay yourself and claim the labor unless you have a separate entity that is that can like a construction company like a construction mm-hmm. company that can be your general contractor but if i am doing my own house and i want to claim i want to claim credits on the labor i put into the project i can't do that okay. i can claim my material receipts but i cannot claim my own labor that's probably another big reason for some people not doing this right and and if you're doing a lot of the work yourself um you may not that helps keep your budget down, but it could impact your ability to hit that 50% of your purchase price because, again, you're not allowed to pay yourself for the labor. And if you're doing most of it yourself, that would take a big chunk out of your labor cost. Now, another thing in terms of just – and because this is a question I get a lot um, – on QREs in kitchens and bathrooms, cabinetry, countertops, fixtures, all eligible – so that's a big expense, and a lot of people think that you can't count those. But if they are, if your cabinets are permanently affixed to the wall, not a piece of furniture that you can pick up and walk away with, then it is, in fact, an eligible expense. Uh, kind of getting a little bit <clears throat> back towards uh, one of the previous mentions here. Uh, you mentioned the ability to sell tax credits. You said that was for the state only, the federal is not eligible? That's correct. Okay. Um, is there any restrictions on the sale of them? Can anybody go out and buy them and apply them to anything? And or? where do you sell them? I'm assuming Craigslist isn't where you <laughs> go. <laughs> um, I, so all of, the, all of the banks buy them, but most of the banks want to buy larger packages. Commerce Bank used to buy tax credits from anybody, but they implemented a $50,000 minimum rule recently. So you have to have a minimum of $50,000 in tax credits to sell to them. There are individuals who will buy them, and the best way to find those people is through a CPA. A lot of CPAs have high-value clients who are always looking to knock a little off, and your CPA may be able to point you to an individual. You can transfer them from one individual to another. does not have to be through an institution. Now, there are syndicators. There are brokers out there. I don't really know a great deal about using that vehicle for transferring them. Um, I'm assuming your return there might be somewhat less than if you're able to sell them directly to an individual. But there are, in fact, um, you know, there are people out there always looking to knock some off their liability. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, hey, call me, Adam Cruz. I, I'd like to save some money on my state taxes. And you could. Um, so if, if, <laughs> if, if Adam Cruz wants, has a big tax bill and wants to save a little bit of money, somebody could come to you and there's a transfer form and they could transfer their tax credits to you and you could use them. Call me. 
<laughs> okay, a final question for me. How much does this, um, I guess, consulting this preservation package with you coming in to help And you don't have to quote your specific rate so no one boxes you in. What is the average range for a consultant for, like, just typical? Boy, that's that's hard. I don't know. And does it range depending on the project? It does range. And some consultants will charge you a percentage of the project cost. Some consultants bill on a strictly hourly basis. And some consultants will either do a flat fee or at least at the front end be able to kind of quote you an amount. Um, So it varies dramatically. Okay. So varies as in like, you know, 500 or to, you know, 5,000 for a small For a small Like a single family home in the city that's being rehabbed. You know, start to present. finish, start to finish your, even on somewhat smaller projects, you're probably looking at, um, a, a couple of thousand dollars from start to finish, which seems so worth it. And the, <laughs> and another thing to be aware of is that those consultant fees are eligible for credits. They are a, an eligible soft cost. One of the things I didn't talk about is that in addition to your hard construction costs, there are soft costs that are eligible, your building permits, your architectural fees during the construction period, real estate taxes, your construction interest, your utilities during the construction period. Those things are all considered eligible soft costs. Your CPA fees to do your cost compilation at the end, another eligible expense, your your consultant that you hire, another eligible expense. So your categories you are both hard construction and soft costs that, that are eligible. Uh, last question from me here. In the last year, we've seen the emergence of opportunity zones designated throughout the city. Are there any additional incentives or restrictions applied to those specific zones when it comes to uh, tax, credit? tax credits? No, no. I mean, because the opportunity zones are a function of that tax reform bill that came out in 2017, and that is a federal thing only. Um, th- and what that opportunity zone does is it essentially allows you to um, reduce the amount of capital gains you pay when you sell the building. And that's really about as much as I know about that one. But, um, but that is really a very different thing. Um, but there are, there definitely is some overlap between opportunity zones. And I know people who are looking to try to take advantage of all of those things. Natasha, you had a client the other day asking about something like market credits. New market credits. New market. Is that something you handle? Maureen? I do not do new market tax credits, and to my knowledge, I asked about them uh, a couple of years ago, and they, at that point in time, they were not accepting applications for new market tax credits. That program, I think, was kind of had been suspended. What is a new market credit? Mm, you're, that's something I couldn't really I, I couldn't speak to um, okay because that's one I really just don't know that much about. My little niche in the world is historic preservation tax credits, I will very quickly say there is a second state of Missouri tax credit available for residential rehabilitation. It's the one known as the lottery. Um, and that one is called the neighborhood preservation tax credit. That's one, that one is only available for owner occupied properties. It does not have the restrictions of a historic tax credit program, but you can use them again in conjunction with each other. So I'll just make a really brief plug on that one. One thing I just wanted to clear up because I, this all sounds really interesting for me of, as maybe something I would want to do for my house, except the part that you, you kind of said that you have to keep the interior, you know, I'm, I would want the open floor plan and you're saying you can't have that. If you have an intact historic floor plan, if you, if your house has not been changed, at least not significantly from when it was built, then they would say, nope, you can't knock out all the walls and open up the floor plan. Now, I have clients who will specifically look for buildings that either were previously renovated and somebody came along and completely reconfigured the floor plan back in, say, the 90s or the 2000s, or they've got a building that has been gutted and is now just a shell. Um, In those cases where the historic floor plan has already been lost either through reconfiguration or through demolition, 
you can do that historic you can do that open floor plan there but if you still have your original walls um they're going to say in those front spaces in those primary spaces no you can't rip it all out they want you to keep those big pocket doors and all that kind of stuff yes yes even though they don't work <laughs> you can fix them though <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing, Maureen. That was awesome. Thank you very much. I can see why you have to have someone who specializes specifically in this type of thing because there's so many little details to know. There are a lot of details to know, and you can get yourself into trouble again if you don't know, for example, that you're not allowed to come in the house and rip the plaster off the walls and expose the masonry underneath. And you submit your final photo showing all this exposed masonry, your whole project can so be no denied. Exposed brick, unless it was existing when you got the building. And so, oh, that's so there are a lot of places, there are a lot of potential pitfalls that that people don't necessarily know about going in. So that's where your consultant is worth his or her weight in gold. And I don't want someone to listen to this thinking that they now know everything and don't need to call you. Because Absolutely. there's a lot of things we there's didn't still cover. a whole lot we that 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 we did not talk about. And if you want to do a like a part two to this someday, we can come back and do yeah, another. We didn't even hit the top of the iceberg here. Yeah, there there's a whole lot more we could be talking about. So. If you don't mind, tell us again how people can get a hold of you, and then we'll wrap it up. Sure. My phone number is area code three one four four zero two nine four four five. My email address m t mcmillan at att.net. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate it. Anybody who's out there with questions uh, or ideas for the future shows, please email us, podcast at hermanlondon.com. We look forward to hearing from you. And thanks for listening, and take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, George DeMera here with Endeavor Capital Mortgage. Today, I wanted to talk to you guys about our Fast Track Mortgage Program. What that does is it allows us to get your loan closed within 14 days. In today's market, we're still seeing multiple offers on properties, which means you've got to be one of the most competitive offers out there. First thing you want to do is make sure you have a great pre-approval. And what I mean by that is turn in your credit, your assets, and your income, and make sure an underwriter looks at that and approves it first. That's one of the great things that Endeavor Capital is. We have our own underwriters on staff. We can get that done for you in an hour. That will make your offer look that much more competitive if you're in a multiple offer situation. So with our fast track mortgage program, from start to finish, we can close you in 14 days. It makes everybody look great. It's fast, easy, and efficient, and we'll hold your hand the whole way through. Look forward to working with you. Please feel free to reach out to me, 314-378-0331. Thanks so much.